Welcome back to session one, part two of just the facts about prediabetes. Let's get started. In the last video, we discussed what is prediabetes and why it's important to make some changes. In this video, we'll review what is diabetes and how it affects glucose or blood sugar absorption. We'll also talk about the risk factors for type two diabetes and we'll talk about some of the lab values that your medical provider may talk about regarding prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. So let's jump in. Let's review what diabetes is. Diabetes happens when the body cannot produce enough insulin, or the cells are resistant to insulin, or the insulin is not working correctly. And then that sugar stays in the blood versus going into the cell. So diabetes is a medical condition where the glucose or the sugar is too high in your blood. And if you have high blood sugar long term, it can lead to some of the serious health complications that we discussed a few slides ago. We'll talk a little bit more about the biology of diabetes at the next slide. In the next two slides, we'll talk about how the body works without diabetes when we eat carbohydrates and how our body absorbs it and uses carbs for energy. And so if we look at the slide, what we can see is when somebody eats an apple, which is a carbohydrate, is that once it's digested, we're breaking the carbohydrates down into individual glucose or sugar molecules, and then those sugars enter the bloodstream, and then we're gonna transfer them to each of the tens of thousands of cells in our body so that we have energy to do the activities that we love to do. So quick recap, when we eat carbs, our body converts them into glucose or sugars, and then they travel through the bloodstream, and then we transfer them from the bloodstream to the many cells in our bodies. And so there's one more step. So once we have those sugars in the bloodstream, we need to get them into the cell so we can use them for energy. The catch is the sugars can't get in the cell by themselves. So when we eat carbohydrates, our body senses this, and then there's another organ, our pancreas, that produces insulin, and then it releases it in the bloodstream, and that insulin travels through the blood, and then it acts as a key to open up the cell door, so now that sugar can leave the bloodstream and can enter the cell so that we can use it for energy. Remember that carbs are the main source of fuel for our brain, our red blood cells, and for energy. We still need to consume them. It's just important that we choose healthier options and healthy portion sizes. We'll review more about that in a bit. So how does the body work with diabetes? So with type two diabetes, when we eat carbs, they are still converted into glucose or sugars and transferred to the bloodstream. Since the body does not produce enough insulin, or if the cells are resistant to insulin, that sugar is staying in the blood and that's resulting in high blood sugar. So our goal with prediabetes is to reduce the insulin resistance so that the sugar leaves the bloodstream and it can enter the cell so it can be used for energy. Remember, carbohydrates are important. They are the main source of fuel for our body. It's just important that we choose those healthier options. Let's review risk factors for type 2 diabetes. Notice that there are two columns on the page. The column on the left hand side includes risk factors that we cannot change, and the column on the right hand side includes risk factors that we can change. Meaning that if we implement small steps, we can decrease our risk for type 2 diabetes. Let's start with the items on the left. The first item is family history. If we have a first degree relative, which means mother, father, brother, or sister that has type 2 diabetes, then we are at a higher risk. The second item is age. Once we reach the age of 45 years or older, we have an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. The third bullet point includes certain races and ethnicities. These populations are predisposed to genetically develop type 2 diabetes. 
These include African Americans, Hispanics, Latino Americans, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, and some Asian Americans. The last item on the left-hand side is if a person has a history of gestational diabetes, or a baby born that is greater than 9 pounds, or a history of PCOS, all those factors also increases the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So now let's switch to the right side. These are items that are lifestyle habits, and if we fall in any of these categories, we do have an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. The first two include too little activity, or you may have heard the term sedentary behavior. The second item is being overweight, particularly if the weight is around the abdomen or the stomach area. If we are making unhealthy eating choices, either by food selection or beverage selection or large portion sizes, this may increase our risk for developing type 2 diabetes. The next ones are use of smoking or tobacco use. And the last item is high blood pressure or high cholesterol. The cholesterol numbers that put you at a higher risk are either high triglycerides or low HDL cholesterol. So remember that one of our goals is to stay positive and to empower you with the facts to prevent type 2 diabetes. So we're going to take those items on the right and we're going to discuss different things that we can do to decrease our risk of type 2 diabetes. So let's start with activity. If we can increase our activity or our movement, that will help us prevent type 2 diabetes. For now, I want you to think of something fun that you enjoy doing that increases your heart rate to a moderate pace. We'll review more specifics in the next few slides. But for now, increasing our activity and getting our heart pumping, it can help in two ways. One, it helps the insulin work better or more efficiently, so then we get more sugar out of the blood and into the cell, and this will help lower our overall blood sugar. Secondly, if we get our heart rate up continuously for 10 minutes at a time, it helps increase our metabolism, which means we burn more calories and will contribute to that weight loss. So what we also know is that losing 5 to 10 percent of the current body weight will have a significant effect on those blood sugar levels, and again, that will help us prevent type 2 diabetes. For the next item, if we can choose some healthier options, such as adding color to our plate with a variety of non-starchy vegetables, that will help us decrease some of the other portion sizes and then also contribute to weight loss. For those that are using um, tobacco or smoking, we do have several resources if you are ready to make some of those changes as well too. We'll talk more about lowering blood pressure and lowering the triglycerides in session two of this website. But for now, the good news is that eating more vegetables, choosing whole grains, increasing the activity, and weight loss, all of these will help you prevent type 2 diabetes as well as lower your blood pressure and those triglycerides. That's a pretty good deal. In the beginning of the slides, we talked about how the CDC estimated that 84 million people have prediabetes, and yet almost 90% of those people do not know it. This is because most people report no symptoms with prediabetes. The American Diabetes Association does recommend that people who are overweight or obese and have one of the listed risk factors that we just discussed should be tested for prediabetes or diabetes. If it's easier, you can also take the CDC risk test to do the beginnings of an assessment. So just click on the blue link, prediabetes quiz, and it'll take you to that website. If you are at risk, please talk to your medical provider and consider a simple blood test to check your status. If you're at a higher risk of prediabetes, there are two simple blood tests that your medical provider can test a fasting blood sugar, or a hemoglobin A1c. The first is a fasting blood sugar, and the term fasting means that you have not eaten for a minimum of seven to eight hours. 
Please note that we do not recommend that you use a home meter for this test, but see your medical provider as their labs have a much higher accuracy rate. You can see on the chart a result of 99 milligrams per deciliter or less indicates blood sugars in the normal range. A result between 100 and 125 indicates a diagnosis of prediabetes, while a result of 126 or greater may indicate a diagnosis of diabetes. But please check with your medical provider as they may have you take the additional second test. So the second blood test that you can use to check to see if you're at risk for prediabetes or diabetes is a hemoglobin A1C. We'll just call it an A1C for short. This test tells you the average blood sugar level over the past two or three months by measuring how much sugar is attached to your red blood cells. Recall that when you eat carbohydrates, they are digested and converted to glucose or sugars and then travel through the bloodstream attached to a protein in your red blood cell called the hemoglobin. So the A1C tests the percentage of sugar attached to that protein. Note that we all have some sugar attached to our red blood cells, but if your cells are resistant to insulin, then there is more sugar in your blood and the A1C percentage will be higher. So again, if you look at the chart, a result of 5.6% or less indicates blood sugars in the normal range. A result between 5.7 and 6.4% indicates a diagnosis of prediabetes. A result of 6.5% or greater may be indicative of diabetes. Again, please check with your medical provider regarding any questions of your specific results. In the next slide, or if you're watching this in smaller parts, in the next video, we'll discuss a clinical trial that demonstrated the positive effects of modest weight loss, increased activity, and healthy eating, and how these steps can reduce your risk of type 2 diabetes. Thank you for watching, and at your convenience, please come back, and for session one, continue to watch parts three, four, and five for additional information about prediabetes.